Uh, Randy and the State Department have uh, very graciously co-funded this with us now for, uh, as I mentioned, 15 years. And uh, it's because of that that we're able to uh, provide this to you for free and provide you these meals and have all these great speakers. And it's uh, it's been a really great partnership. Uh, uh, Randy, I went to the website and pulled off your 25 page bio. And uh, then I spoke to your mother and she sent me one line. So it's, I'm someplace in between there. Uh, uh, Randy's been our commissioner in uh, of education in Kansas. Uh, he's towards the end of his ninth year, I think, as commissioner. Um, I'm not gonna go into many details. Uh, he uh, had been superintendent in McPherson, um, did some really amazing things in McPherson when there was uh, some uh, legislators that wanted to move to innovation uh, and they wanted to go to charter schools. And Randy said, no, why don't you fund public schools and give us the chance to show you what we can do with this extra funding. And of course, uh, created the redesign program for the state that has had uh, impact in districts all over the state. Um, and uh, has fought the battles for all of us through the legislature over the years. I've had the chance uh, to work with Randy in a number of ways, and I just I consider it an honor uh, to have him as a colleague and a friend and as a speaker at, a, at our conference. So Randy, thank you for being here. Well, good afternoon again. Uh, thank you, Rick, and thank you all for participating. Uh, this has always been a real pleasure for us to partner with University of Kansas to put on this event. And uh, the last time I believe we were here, Rick, in this in this spot uh, all together, I had a uh, counterpart named Brad Neuenswander who was late. He came flying in because he couldn't find the place, if I remember, and he he thought we were out on campus in Lawrence. So uh, he anyway, so we did it together. And now, if you know, Brad is employed by the University of Kansas. Oh, I don't see him here because uh, this got moved. I think he's on vacation today. So I uh, just needed to make sure that for the record, since we're recording this, that he knows um, that uh, I spoke uh, I spoke uh, about him. Uh, Rick has been such a great person to work with for on so many issues in the University of Kansas. Of course, as you know, um, has been the history of uh, assessment in Kansas started at this university and and continues uh, in, in some capacity. So we're so uh, we're so pleased about that. Uh, I'm going to share with you just a few ideas. I know you've been doing TED talks. Uh, my understanding is that uh, you've decided that you all are back in kindergarten. The attention span you have is somewhere around one minute and forty five seconds. And then uh, you're to discuss what you've learned. And then you look at each other, go, what do they say? Oh, let's look at the screen. And then because uh, you, you're all, we have so many devices that you're checking. So I want to share with you a few things that uh, I actually shared this week at the State Board of Education uh, and uh, been thinking about a little bit about a little bit of look back. And then as we think about it, the, the journey forward uh, and going forward. And let's see. I'm able to advance slides. I send you greetings from the State Board of Education. 10 elected people that most people in our field of education have no idea who they are. Now, as a former social studies teacher, I will tell you that is a tremendous problem. So I know just recently, Rick was talking to you about literacy. Let me talk to you about civic engagement. How do you vote for people that you don't know? Well, you don't because very few people vote. And then we wonder about well, what are these people doing that get elected, all right, in all aspects. I will say this, you're very attuned and uh, all of America's, if they are active uh, politically, are very attuned to what happens at a national level. They're very attuned to President Biden or former President Trump and in some cases what a, a U.S. Secretary of Education like Betsy DeVos did. And very few people know who the local school board who's on their city commission, who's on their county commission, or who's on their state board. And those people believe, let me tell you, are making most of the decisions that affect your life. They really are. And that's where most people uh, don't know. So I send you 
uh, regards from them. And they're wrestling with a lot of these problems that you've been wrestling with today. So let's start with what I know you've been talking about. Lead the world, I'll share some, I'll share some metrics with you. How about we talk about each child? And how about we talk about the fact that we're so far away from developing a system that addresses that? And by the way, I'm talking to you as one of you, right? This is an indictment on me. We're trying to work this out. We're trying to figure out how do you take Derby High School, 2,000 kids, and individualize that for every kid? It's hard because we've developed systems of efficiency, right? When do the buses run? You don't mess with that. You don't mess with that. You have a great idea. You don't mess with that because it involves the whole day. When do you do lunch? You don't mess with that. Now, once we do those two things, we're pretty hamstrung on what we can do, right? If you're in elementary, you know what else it is. When are my specials? So I get some planning time. All right, now all of a sudden, we're just magnify that. How do we address each student? I think that's being the convergence of technology, parent demands are directly opposite to the system that we created called school, which doesn't do that very well. It does it well for big swath of kids, but it doesn't do very well for the kids on the margins at toward the top end or toward the bottom end. And even we were just talking at lunch at, at our table, how many kids, how many kids enter their senior year with well above enough credits to graduate and look at their senior year as a waste? Because what are they counting? Credits to graduate instead of prepare for what I'm going to do in the next journey of my life. We can change that. We don't have to wait till tomorrow to change that. We don't have to wait for someone to tell us to change that. We can change that. And it's the hardest thing, hardest thing for us to do because we all went to this thing called school and we're now in this thing called school and parents fondly remember generally or unfondly this thing called school and we want to perpetuate it and keep it going. So I want you to think through that lens. I was just talking to a parent who was asking a school district, could my student who's a sophomore take dual credit? Fairly advanced, at least if you look at assessment scores. What was the answer? No. Why? They're not old enough and we don't do that. You have to wait till your junior year because we don't allow sophomores to do dual credit. Why? No, 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 that's the answer. Now I'm asking you, why? Because maybe we have to do it for everyone that asks. And we don't know how, and then we don't know how to run a system around that. Does that make sense? I'm just telling you, we were talking about COVID. COVID exposed us, all right? And now everyone says, well, I want this. And, and, and by the way, we've been doing this for 50 years. It's called Burger King. Have it your way, right? I come to it, right? I mean, Burger King ran a slogan in the 1970s about this. So let's talk about the success of each student. And, uh, and let's, let's, uh, let's start with a Jeopardy. You guys like Jeopardy? And the answer is, 5,006089, Final Jeopardy, what is the question? If I, could, if I could do my good, you know, uh, do the music, right? The answer is 5,06089. This is bad instruction by what I'm doing right now, by the way. But we have people online, you know, and so I'm. This is the number of students in schools accredited by the State Board of Ed. This is private, public, not counting homeschooling. Last year, half a million. Used to be when I started teaching in Tescott, Kansas. On a good on a good day, I saw 69 students, but it was the entire student body, by the way. And I taught every class, so I got to see them all. 69. Taught in Andover High School, I taught U.S. history to 180 students a day. Tried to impact those students. Then became a principal, tried to impact a school of about 600. Became a superintendent of about 2,500. And now I'm somewhat responsible for half a million. And so I see things through the lens of your kids and your grandkids. That's the way I see it. 
I don't know. It's, I'm trying to help design policy that impacts your kids and your grandkids. And I hope you think the same way. And I hope every time you look at the system that we created and it doesn't work, to ask the question, what could we change? Not, well, who's going to change that? I wish we could change that. Who's going to? We can change it. We can change that. So let me share with you a photo. And I just want you to study this photo. Don't want you to shout this out. This is not the popcorn coral response on this one. All right, as you study that photo, I call this an iconic photo. What I'd like for you to do is just simply do this. If you know who this gentleman is in this photo and what this photo is, raise your hand. Okay. For the record of you online that I can't see, I'm going to say that's about 10 people in the audience, maybe 15. Some of you didn't raise your hand about like this and I couldn't see it because you were afraid that I would call on you and you would have to answer and you weren't quite sure of your answer. We appreciate you playing halfway uh, today. All right. So let me share with you uh, this photo. And uh, let me pull this up just so I get this entirely uh, accurate for you. This is the state track meet in Wichita, Kansas in 1965. This gentleman's name is Jim Ryan, and I believe he still lives in the greater Lawrence area. And in 1965, Jim Ryan won the state track meet, at that time the mile, and he ran that in three minutes, 58 seconds and three tenths. He was the fastest miler in the history of the world as a high school runner. The East on his jersey is Wichita East, where he went to high school. And this was at Wichita State. I want you to notice a couple of things. Look at Jim Ryan's face. He just finished the fastest mile run by a high school runner in the history of the world. He doesn't look happy. Would you agree? Look at the gentleman, though, next to him. And look at the people around. I think that says something about our system. This is really hard work. And sometimes people look at it and say, no, oh, it's really easy. I, I often say, if you're in a group of people that are non-educators, explaining our work is really hard. Because the work is really hard. And it looks really, well, you, got, you only teach for nine months. You only work six and a half hours a day. Right? I mean, you're looking at that objectively, right? Those are just people that speak non-educators. It's really hard. Jim Ryan did some technical preparation. He ran, he ran quarters, right, at certain times. There was some technical preparation, and it's hard, hard work to do this really good. By the, other, by, by the way, you might also notice Jim Ryan set this record on a cinder track. So I want you to know this. ESPN, just a few years ago, asked people to vote for the greatest high school athlete ever. Tiger Woods, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, the greatest high school athlete ever, Jim Ryan, as voted by ESPN, a Kansan. So this work is hard. It's hard. And it's because of these darn kids that messes up every day, right? Give, bring us joy. They're, they're not a, we can't run it like a factory because they have their own needs and their own desire. So this is a graphic, nothing new on this except a new look of graphic of the things that lead towards success. We're gonna talk about two big buckets of those, academic and what we call the Kansas Can competencies, again, Work done right here at the University of Kansas. That is uh, groundbreaking work. Now I'll just, I'll just put a plug in on the Kansas Can competencies that we'll get to later. They were doing work in Michigan when I found out that they were in Lawrence and I was in Topeka and we weren't doing this work. And so that, you know, that sometimes right in your doorstep. Georgetown education policy on education and workforce. Say, in our state today, if you go apply for a job, 
you're going to need a high school diploma and another piece of paper. 73% of the jobs in our state require you to have a high school diploma and another piece of paper. That other piece of paper is a baccalaureate, master's, PhD, or professional degree. 37% of the labor market is exactly that. And 36% is an associate degree or what we call certificate like welding, CNA, physical therapy assistant. We go on and on, right? But I call that the skilled labor market, 73%. So I want to show you how we've done in Kansas, because I don't know about you. I used to say, did you pick up the Kansas City Star this morning? It used to be called the Kansas City Times in the morning, Kansas City Star in the afternoon. Wasn't that right? Orange Journal World. No one, do any of you still read that by paper? Most of you are getting everything here, right? Or on a tablet. So I don't know, when you pick up, and the, and the subject is education, whether it's Kansas or across the United States. Is it generally what a great job we're doing? I don't know about you. Maybe I'm just seeing the wrong feed. Maybe I'm done too many of the wrong clicks and my feed now is only showing me the ones that say, you suck. I don't know, right? I mean, some, some, I want to show you though something. This is census data. So we can't make it up. It's census data dating back to 1940. Number of Kansans. 24 years of age and older that have graduated high school. Does that make sense? Here's the data. By decade. Twenty twenty one is the last data. Instead of twenty twenty, the census was postponed a year because of COVID. So you see it's a little off. 91, 92% of Kansas now have a high school education at age 24. When they leave high school, that number is just below 90. So there's a little bit of gain from there until 24. In 1940, that number was 28.5%. 1940. The census started tracking those that went to college and have some college, but not a baccalaureate degree. So in this would be associate degree, people that don't complete, and certificates. All right, we'll talk about that. And the last in the green, those are baccalaureate degree or higher. And you can see in the 40s, it was 2.3%. But I want you to go for some of you that will call veterans in the audience, 1980s. Some of you, you know, still rocking out like it was the 80s. Uh, some of you really old like me, it'd be the 60s or 70s, but we'll go with the 80s. Only 9.5% of people had a baccalaureate, master's, PhD, or professional degree. Today, that number, think about this. Today in our state, forget Missouri, because it's easy to forget them, right? In our state, more people have a baccalaureate degree, a master's degree, a PhD, or a, do a professional degree, lawyer, doctor, than graduated high school in our state in 1940. Now, how did they do that? Because we don't teach them anything? I don't think so. Remarkable. Remarkable achievement. And you can see most of that's happened since 1980. The acceleration of most of that, especially on the college end, is happening since 1980. So let me share a little bit different piece of data with you. These are education credentials, ages 25 to 65. Lumina, looking at the census data, said 10% of the kids in Kansas or the adults in Kansas do not have a high school education, 10%. Today in 2023, it's not 1940. The job market for dropouts in high school is not good relative to good jobs. Now, I say that and someone's gonna say, Randy, I know a guy, that's, I do too. I know a lady. Yes, there are success stories of dropouts, and we run Time Magazine articles around them. But they're not the majority of people that drop out of high school. And so it masks that sometimes when, when we talk about that. So if we could, about 40,000 kids graduate from a Kansas high school every year, that number means about 4,000 do not. What if we could cut that in half? Just in half, right? 
And you know how hard it is because I know how you're trying to save kids. But by the way, those of you that work in high schools and you're trying to save kids, it happened long before they ever came to you. At about fourth, fifth grade, they started tuning out. By sixth, seventh grade, they weren't coming to school. And by the time they got to high school, now they're ready to drop out. But they couldn't drop. I mean, they, they weren't going to drop out when they were 10. They may have wanted to. They did. But so you're just the recipient of that. We're talking about a systemic issue. 23% have a high school education or a GED, no, no further. 13% went to college, didn't left without anything. I want to come back to that. We have two categories called industry and college certificates. This is someone that's earned a welding certificate or went to Washburn Tech and, re, and spent two years and received a certificate from them in heating and cooling. Does that make sense? Combine that, it's about tw uh, 9%. About 9% have an associate degree, 23% of a baccalaureate, 13% have master's, PhD, et cetera. Now, we're trying to get to 73. So just use the baccalaureate, master's, PhDs. We're at 36, right? 30, and we need 37. We're, we're pretty, pretty good there. Look below the baccalaureate. 9% associate, six, three on certificates. That's about 21%. We need to up that to that skilled labor market to be about the same as the baccalaureate, master's, PhDs. 13% of kids went somewhere and never finished. They're not any better off than the ones that didn't go. Does that make sense? And what they may have, we don't know this from this data, what they may have is what? Debt. So if we could just figure out why those 13% went off and didn't finish, and we could capture them some way in a skilled market, whether that be a two-year degree certificate or baccalaureate, think of the trajectory we, we could change with that. That's what we're trying to do. But we can only do that, I don't think, by trying to squeeze out of the existing system more than we're getting. Because we're squeezing that system hard and that's why we've done so, so well. But now, when you start to get to this, these margins toward the top, we've got to look at each child and figure out what is it that we're just not quite reaching. It's not our fault. It's our fault that we don't respond to that. It's not our fault that we created it. It's our fault that we don't respond. And here's the economic impact of that in Kansas. You drop out of school, the average salary is just under 31000 a year. Are there more people that make more? Yes. People that make less? Yes. 31, 30,800 is the average. Those that graduate high school, look at their earning power, goes up. Not quite $4,000 a year for all of your life. Look, if I go to college, here's the interesting thing about this data. It includes certificates, associate degree, and those that drop out. If you take out the ones that drop out, this number actually gets higher their earning, earning power gets higher. There's your baccalaureate, master's, PhD. Does more education generally matter? Yes. All things being equal, more education generally matters. Now, you could say, is a PhD in psychology worth as much as a baccalaureate in engineering? Maybe not. From an earning power. I'm not going to, right? But in general, more education matters. And look at this. This is Kansas data. Again, I grew up on the Oklahoma border, so I always bag on Oklahoma people. And if you look at what's going on in Oklahoma, you could easily do that today in their systems. How about poverty rates? I don't graduate from high school. 22% of those people are living in poverty. So they're taking from the system, not contributing to the system. If I get more education, that drops to under 15%. I just graduate high school. If I do something beyond high school, it drops to 8.5%. If I go on to a baccalaureate, master's, PhD, it drops to 4%. I can increase earnings. I can decrease poverty. I can have a better educated workforce if we can attend to each child and maximize a couple big buckets, academic and something called social, emotional, or Kansas can competencies. Those are the two buckets. Now, the details of that's all messy, right? Details of that is very messy. 
So let me look, let me help you take a look at academics. This is, this is something you all love. It's called state assessment data. One test on one day, misused to the history of no child left behind. And if you live through that era, I just sent shivers down your spine because we misused it. We took kids out of recess. We cut social studies. We cut science. We did all kinds of things chasing a test score. We should never chase a test score ever, ever, ever. We should chase the rigor of academic standards of learning. So I'm using this as a measurement, not as a gotcha. Does that make sense? We, we weaponize it. What I'm showing you, I'm gonna back up here just a little, maybe. What I'm showing you is, this is graduation based upon two sets of cohorts in Kansas, 70 some thousand kids. The big, so this is level one, that would be the lowest academic kids on that assessment to level four, the highest academic students on that assessment in 10th grade. Two, did they graduate high school? So level one kids on about average, 80% of those kids that scored in level one graduated high school, level four kids, about 96% graduate high school. You see that? That's the big bars. Language arts is, is the blue, math is the orange. And I'm just averaging the two. We have 40% of kids scored in level one on that assessment. What if we can move them to level two? Could we see a different outcome just by that? Well, I don't know, because this is correlational data, not causation. And the smaller bars, if you would, then, the blue is language arts, the orange, mathematics. That represents those that went on after high school to earn something else. A certificate like a CNA, or maybe they did it in high school, all the way up to PhD professional degrees. Again, see how the correlation to academics to future success. Now, you could say, which I know you will, Randy, they don't take it serious in 10th grade. I know all that. I'm just showing the correlation of what they did to what ends up happening, happening to them, and it's a fairly tight correlation. But look at level four, 96% graduate, 82% go on to earn something else. Level four is equivalent to about a 30 on the ACT test. For those of you who want a comparison on a 36 point scale. Our statisticians and research people tell us if academics alone caused you to be successful, successful meaning I get to go on and pursue something higher ed that number would be 95% or greater. Why isn't it? Popcorn coral response, why isn't it? Other ideas? Why aren't we at 95% of level four kids going on to school? And why in the world can 28% of kids in level one go on to school, right? Our researchers would say that number would be about 5%. You'd have some chance, right, in there if academics alone caused this to occur. There must be something other than academics to cause you to be successful. And while it's a great predictor, it's the combination. Of, so here we are back to 1965 and a guy running on a cinder track that nobody here knew of or remembers that happens to still live in the greater Lawrence area that served as U.S. representative for a number of years also. The combination of training, God-given ability, doesn't happen every day that someone's going to be that great a miler, right? Even with training. And showing up every day, something called perseverance and goal setting and structure, all of these things. We call that the Kansas competency wheel designed right here at the University of Kansas. It's these skills in combination with those academic skills of reading, of math, of science, of social studies, the academic contents we teach along with these that make up success. We know that. How much more research do we need? Sometimes I think, first of all, you're gonna say, Randy, you think this because you're old and that's true. I want to digress for a second on, on that age thing that I just brought up. There is a great video clip that I love that I carry around on various slides. 
And it's Steve Jobs, you know who he is, the founder of Apple, co-founder, and Bill Gates, by the way, who just met with the chairman of China, Bill Gates, who started a little company called Microsoft. And they're sitting on a stage being interviewed like this, about six months before Steve Jobs passes away. And they're reminiscing about the good old days. Microsoft DOS, for those of you old enough to remember, pre-Windows, Apple IIe before there was the Macintosh. And Gates is telling the story and Jobs, uh, you know, always wasn't the most tactful person in the room. And he reaches over and nudges Gates, in the middle of this interview and says, Bill, you remember when we were the two youngest kids in the room? I remember when I was the youngest kid in the room. Something happened along the way, you get old. And you think about these skills a lot. And you think about how do we teach self-regulation? Can it be taught? Yes, research is there. By the way, that research on academics and all of these skills, you can go back to Ralph Tyler, Carol, Ben Bloom, Madeline Hunter, Larry Lazat, Ron Edmonds. I'm giving you people from about the 1940s to the 1980s who said, we find these remarkable schools that are overcoming the odds of social uh, economic status and, and racial divide. And they're different. And what they explained then that John Hattie calls collective efficacy. John Kennedy said, um, you know, we're gonna go to the moon. And one of the astronauts on that trip said, we just did. We just decided we're going to the moon and we did. And if we can decide that kids are gonna be successful, sometimes they do. Versus, well, I can't teach that kid. Did you see his mom? Did you see the background he came from? All that's a given. These skills are really important and they can be taught. And these may be the six most important of that relative to the future success, according, could be. I wanna put that in there. We're still studying this because you're gonna challenge me on, well, how about curiosity? It's pretty good. Hmm? Teamwork, pretty good. But if you're a pre-K kindergarten teacher, we darn well have to teach self-regulation, am I right? Otherwise, you can't get to self-efficacy, goal setting initiative, and eventually to perseverance, which take you back to Jim Ryan. Can't get there. So this work is really important. Your work is really important. All of this work is extremely important. And so I ask as you leave here today and you're getting ready, your bellies are full, you got the rest of summer to take off because you don't do anything in summer. No matter if you're at the university level or you know K-12. I want you to have a sense of urgency that, you know, when we come back in the fall, if you've got 20 kids in the classroom, 45 in a classroom, you're secondary, you see 180, you're in university preparing students or working, whatever your role is in this thing, what do we have to do to change to reach every kid? And then go do it. You have permission to go do it. We can't treat every kid the same, but we can treat them fairly and that family fairly. So I hope you have a sense of urgency because as we, you've been talking about all day, the world is different than it was for me going to school. It's different. AI is going to make it even much more different. Is it better, worse? I don't know. We'll debate that. We'll learn whether it is, but I can just tell you as, as I drove over here and had the address in my phone book, it would tell me, speed check ahead, hazard coming up, called 69 South. Oh my gosh, how bad is that? That's more than we were sending people to the moon. So we have to have a sense of urgency that we can get this done because the requirements of the level of education, we're not living in 1940 anymore. And an eighth grade education in one room schoolhouse is not sufficient for economic security. I wanna thank you. You didn't have to be here today. I know that KU fed you really well and has the great accommodations, but that isn't enough to get you out here. It's this thing in your DNA that all of you have that, again, I think what's amazing about educators, we get up every morning 
and that we, we have something wrong with us. We can't wait to go try to do this work with other people's kids. It's unique. And I want to thank you for that and applaud you for that. And Rick, thank you for 15 years of this partnership with KU. We hope to see you again next summer. And we hope that you have a wonderful rest of the summer. So thank you very much. And if you want to pose any questions before you leave, I'm happy. If you want to storm the door, I'm happy for that too. So whatever you'd like to do. I'll hang around if you have questions. All right, we'll do that.